That song reminds us of the kind of God that we can go to. The kind of God who listens to us. Who wants us to talk to Him. Because He has the character. The word holy means set apart, other than. God has the character to receive us, not abuse us, not misuse us. He's awesome. And so this morning, would you take this moment and take your need to the Lord? Whatever that might be. Maybe you you have a need in your business, a need in your family, um, a need that you can't even talk about. Let's take those needs to the Lord and let's ask Him to help us. Father, You are holy. And we know that when we come to You, You won't manipulate us, abuse us, overwhelm us, but that what You do will bring peace to us and healing and grace and mercy. And so we come to You knowing that You will never do to us what people do to us. But you'll love us as you created us to be loved. Now, Lord, we look to you and ask you for your blessing. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, one of the things I love to do is play bagpipes. Now, playing bagpipes is a natural thing for me because it takes a lot of hot air. And one of the... (laughs) And one of my family traits, I think it's in our genes on the, in the Mills family, is that we just have an abundance of hot air. And so this is a perfect instrument for dispensing hot air. But it's not an instrument that is easy to play. It's one of those instruments you have to have help. You can't just pick one up in a store and say, I think I'll strum that thing a little bit. I think I'll make a little music. It just won't work. So 20 years ago, I happened to go to a festival in Atlanta, and I couldn't believe it. It was a Scottish festival, and there were people running around in kilts by the hundreds and hundreds. And I saw these two guys holding bagpipes, standing alone, talking. And I approached one of them, and I said, Hey, I want to learn how to play bagpipes. Can you teach me? I didn't know these guys from Adam. And one of the guys said, well, I guess I could teach you. And that started my journey with taking lessons. I became a student. I submitted myself to a teacher. It's a pretty amazing thing when you think about it. Well, for 20 years, I've been listening to instructors who will say, Dwayne, do it this way. No, Dwayne, do it that way. Now, for the last 10 years, I've taken from one guy. Right now, we take lessons over Skype. Skype is a wonderful thing. If you know what Skype is, it's where you can get on the internet and you can connect with somebody in another country. And I take lessons from a guy in Canada, of all places. Well, the lesson begins like this. And get all seated up and we go, okay, Dwayne, how you doing? How's your week? Fine. How's your practice? Oh, practice is going great. That's usually his very first question. How's practice? He doesn't say, how's the family? How's the dog? How's your cat? How's practice? Because as a teacher, he wants to know how I'm doing with my study. Well, I say, well, I think I'm doing fine. You say, all right, let's start playing some tunes. So I put some of that hot air in those pipes, and I crank them up, and I start playing a 2-4 march, or a straspe, or a reel. Those are dance tunes. Or I'll play uh, some other thing. But then I'll stop. And he'll say, all right, that sounded pretty good. Or he'll say... No, 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 no. That's not right. You need to fix this. I've told you before, you shouldn't play that note this way. You're, you're making that note too fast and this one too slow. You're cutting that one and not hanging on to this one. He gives me all kinds of instruction. Now, what I can do is I say, I could say back to him, oh, that's just not fair. That hurts my feelings. How dare you criticize me and tell me what I'm not doing right? Well, he could say back to me, well, how dare you waste my time? Do you want to take a lesson or not? Well, yeah, I want to take a lesson. Well, do you want to learn? Well, yeah, I want to learn. Then I'm telling you what you need to do to improve. I'm telling you what you, what you need to adjust. If I'm a good student, I will listen to what my teacher tells me, and then I'll implement. I'll practice it. 
and practice it and practice it. And I'll come back and I'll say, all right, teacher, how does this sound? And I'll crank up the pipes again and I'll play the same tune and he'll say, that's better. Finally, you got it right. That's what a model student does. Many of you are teachers and you know the difference between a student and someone who just takes up time and space in your classroom. Someone who's just taking up time and space is always griping, always groaning, always complaining. Don't tell me what to do. I don't, who are you? I don't want to hear it. But somebody who wants to learn takes the instruction, finds a way to implement what you've given them. They, they just breathe it in because they want to learn. They want to know. So I submit to my teacher because I love my instrument and I want to do better. I want to sound better. I don't want to sound like a squealing pig in a hailstorm. I want to sound like a musician. I want to be in harmony. I don't want to be out of tune, out of time. I want to do it right. Wouldn't you want to attend the same kind of church? A church that is a model church, a church that listens to its teacher, the Lord Jesus, and models itself the way it should be. Last Sunday morning, we began this series on how to be a model church. The first principle of being the kind of church we want to be and should be is not based on what the building looks like, or what the programs are all about, or how many people are coming, or how much money is coming in. The model church is the kind of church that models three things in particular. Look with me to chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul, in writing this letter to this church, this young church of new believers primarily, he wrote to them and he commended them. He praised them because they were taking lessons from the Apostle Paul and they were implementing what he had taught them. They were receiving the instruction. Now, you as parents know how frustrating it is when you take your kids to lessons and you sacrifice money and you sacrifice time. You take your kid to a lesson, an instrument lesson, and they don't practice. And every day you have to say, practice. I don't want to practice. Practice. I don't want to practice. Practice or I'll shoot you. I'll practice. Practice or you'll never breathe. Practice or you won't get Christmas. You hate that, don't you? That, that, that's not a model student. You want to provide the opportunity, but you want to see something happen there. Well, Paul preached the gospel to these people in this town, and they received it in ways that were beyond his expectations. Verse 2, we give thanks to God always for you, always making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and your patience of hope. Your steadfastness. You hang in there. So a model church is not known by the size of the building or the kind of service we have. And you might say, well, I want, a, I want an old-time church, a new-time church, a big church, small church. I want a, a preacher that does this or a preacher that does that. I want a tall pastor, a skinny pastor, a short pastor. I want one with this degree or no degrees. That's irrelevant. That's irrelevant. That's not what makes a model church. The church is a group of people who have been born again, who are following Jesus, and they are following Jesus as their example. The model church sets a high standard. And the highest standard you can set is to be the kind of people, the kind of church that is known all over Campbell County as a church that has faith in Jesus but they're always they're working that faith. They're, at, they're busy because of their faith. The second characteristic is their labor of love. It's hard work to love people. You, you know that, right? It's hard work to love kids that are not your own and to lead a children's program or a Sunday school or an outreach program or, or a, a missions project. It's hard work to love. But sometimes it's tough to keep your hope. The endurance of hope. 
But that hope is not in whether the church will be successful or not. Your hope is not in whether you have a good pastor or a bad pastor. Your hope is in the Lord Jesus. And that is the defining factor. Then he goes on to verse 4 and he gives us the second component of a model church. If the first component is setting a high standard of faith, hope, and love, the second component of a model church and the kind that I want to be a member of and the kind I want to pastor is the, is the model church that responds to what they hear. Responds to what they hear. How many sermons have most of you heard? You go, oh, this is more than I want to think about. That's like saying, how many lessons have you taken on the piano? Oh, Lord, the, the 30 minute lessons or the hour lessons. I've taken more lessons than I ever want to remember. Well, then quit taking the lessons. Oh, it's awful. A model church responds to what they hear from the Lord as their instructor. He said the Holy Spirit is going to guide you into truth. And every time you hear a sermon or a Sunday school lesson, or you read a page in your devotional, or you read the Scripture, you're hearing from the Lord. The Lord is trying to instruct you, guide you, lead you. And a church that is growing is a church that is, first of all, growing in that learning process from the Lord. They're responding to what they hear. Well, look with me at verse 4. He says, hey, church, you've got this faith, hope, and love going on and knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. When you respond to what you hear and you just don't go, oh, my God, Lord, heaven, please deliver me from another sermon. You're missing your lesson that day. Well, I don't want to take a lesson. Then why are you here? Well, I want to be a better Christian. Then how are you going to do that? The only way for me to become a better bagpiper or pianist or whatever it is, is I have to take a lesson every week. I have to practice every day. And if you're not in, your, in the Word of God every day, you're not going to learn as much if you're in it once a week, you don't learn as much as someone who's in it every day who's ingesting God's Word. Well, he says when you respond to what you hear, it proves who you are. Notice how he says, hey, church at Thessalonica, knowing this, beloved brethren and elected by God, when you, when you live out the truth of who you are, it shows something to everyone around you. First of all, that you're loved by God. This to me is one of the most important insights into Scripture. Do you realize you are beloved by God? And the, the Greek tense here is a, is a verb that says, and the results continue. Some of you think, well, I got saved in 1994 and God loved me and gave me salvation. But that's not the whole story. He continues to love you. You are still being loved by God. Does that, that ever sink in? That God still loves you? It's not like your husband. He used to love you, but He doesn't love you. Or your wife, or your cousin, or your grandparents. God continues to love you. You're beloved by God, and you're, now, you're, you're living out that personal experience, but you're also chosen by God. The Bible says there's none that seeks after God, not even one. The beauty of salvation is that we are a group of people who'd rather have it our own way. We're not interested in God, but God comes knocking on our door and says, I'm talking to you. I, I want to offer you a free gift of salvation. And we respond in faith to that. That response by faith in the work of Jesus, living out this love that God has for us proves who we are. We're living up to our, to our true calling. Acting like people who are loved. Can you tell the difference in people who are loved and people who are not loved? You ever seen a couple? And you can look at that couple and you can say, that woman is not loved. Now you, you ladies in the congregation, you know. You can, you can smell it. You can see it. You can sense it. You know a woman spurned. A woman who's not loved. You know that. 
How do you know that? Well, there's just something you see in the eyes, in the expression, in, in, in the behavior of someone who's loved and not loved. Those of us who've experienced the love of God, there's something about that experience that is unlike anything else. Well, here's a second component of responding to what you hear. Look down at verse 5. When you respond to the Lord's instruction to you, you're revealing what God has done, already done in you. Verse 5. For, Paul says, our good news did not come to you in word only, but in power, in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance. God has done four amazing things here. God has used words to reach you. Now Paul says, our, our gospel, our preaching didn't come to you in just yakety yak, religious talk. We weren't just babbling off a bunch of stuff, rattling off sermons. And that's not what I do every Sunday, is just rattle off a sermon. Is this rattling off sermons? I, there's a lot of other things you could be doing and I could be doing if it's just rattling off religious talk. And Paul is saying, when I came and shared Jesus with you, it wasn't just about going through the motions, talking about God because I'm supposed to, and you listening to it because you're supposed to. It's something dynamic taking place. That the words I brought were life-changing words. But then he said, it wasn't just words, but it was also power. God has used power with those words. There's something pretty special about the Word of God. It's living. It's active. It'll cut you or it'll heal you. Sometimes it'll slice you open and you'll think, Lord, nobody ever said that to me. I never saw that in me. What am I seeing in the Scripture? Sometimes it convicts. Sometimes it heals. Sometimes it's balm. Sometimes it's like salt. But that's what the Word of God does. It pierces to the soul and it speaks to you as power. The Scripture is not just an archaic book of words, ink on paper. It's living. It's real. And so Paul says, when we came to you and started telling you about Jesus, it wasn't just yak, 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 yak. Going through the motion stuff. There was power and you got changed and the fact that you now love Jesus is proof of the power. How is it that you here today love a God you have never met and you've never seen and you talk about a heaven you've never been to and you talk fondly of the day when you're going to be in the presence of the Lord. You've never been there. How do you know you're going to like it? Well, the pastor, the scripture says so. Why are you listening to the Bible? Well, because it's God's Word. Ah, that's the point. It's God's Word. God has spoken. God has communicated to us. And so, when we live out what we've listened to, it reveals what God has done in using not just words, but power. And, he says, in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the power. We get our word dynamite from this word power. It's something, something huge, something great, something magnificent. Something engulfing, empowering about this, about this experience. In the power of the Holy Spirit, he says. And he's using much conviction, he says. And in much assurance, much confidence. God used Paul as a man who had embraced the gospel to preach to a group of people who hadn't. Because Paul believed it. He came and preached not a message of, well, hey, I'm getting paid to do this, so I'm going to tell you it's true. Hope you believe it and keep giving me money. Do I get in this pulpit every week to say things to you because, I get, hey, I get a salary and I appreciate my salary. But is that what it's all about? Have I come here to go through the motions because, hey, it's a great gig, it's a good job. People believe in it, they give you some attention, and you get a little bit of uh, you know, uh, respect. Really? Not much anymore for this kind of job across our country. But I'm not here giving you lessons on something I don't believe in. Something that I don't embrace. Something I've not experienced. 
Neither did Paul. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, that He went to a cross, that He raised from the dead. I believe that Jesus Christ is coming back and I order my life around my salvation experience in Jesus. I am not here doing what I do with my bagpipes, which is displacing hot air. I believe this. And why do I stand here every week and encourage you to believe? I... I beg you to believe because I believe this is true. There's a confidence in it. So God used genuine conviction being lived out in the life of Paul to connect with these people in Thessalonica. But also, it reveals that God has used the power of example. He says, we came to you in that much confidence as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. If you have a pastor who's in the pulpit because he's getting something out of it for himself, like financial gain, social gain, whatever gain, abuse of people, like Jim Jones did many years ago when he led a bunch of people to the jungle and abused them to the point of death. Paul says, I didn't come to you like that. You saw my life. It's real to me. I believe it. And so I shared what was true in my own life with you. So when you respond to the Word of God, it shows what God has done in you. What has God has done in the one communicating truth to you. And He reveals what kind of church you really are. In the year 2000, Maurice Green was considered the fastest human on earth. He could run. But he had a teacher who was himself a former Olympian. And Maurice Green listened to the instruction of his teacher. And because of what he received from his teacher, the teacher had credibility. He knew how it was to run, how to compete, how to go through life as an athlete. Maurice Green listened, Maurice Green applied, and Maurice Green excelled. And Paul is saying to the Thessalonians, this is what I did, here's how you responded. And we as a church are still in that position of responding to what the Lord is trying to give to us. Well, the third thing, when you respond to the Word of God, it shows who you've become. Who you as an individual and we as a church have become. Look at verse 6. And you became followers of us, that's Paul and all of his friends, and of the Lord. Ultimately, we are here to follow Jesus first. You check out what I say and see if it's of the Lord. Don't follow me, you follow Jesus. The Word of God is to encourage you to follow Him. We've spent almost a year studying the life of Christ. Why? Well, you needed something to preach about. Wrong. Why did we go through the Gospel of John? So that you would understand Jesus and therefore model your life around Jesus, receive the words of Jesus, and embrace Jesus. It doesn't matter what you think of me. It doesn't matter. I'm not in this scenario like that. Your eyes are to be on Him. And Paul is saying, when you respond to what you hear as a model church, you are going to show something about what you truly embrace. Well, he says, you become followers of, of us and of the Lord, having received the Word. Now this word, by the way, followers, you became followers. This is a word we don't like in the English language very much. It's the word mimic. When we talk of someone mimicking someone else, we say, well, that's negative. They're just trying to parrot what that other person says, how they act. Oh, look at there. They're even using the words the same way. Oh, look, they're even talking the same way. Uh -huh. That's just hypocritical. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I, I am trying all the time to mimic my teacher because I want to play just like him. He's one of the greatest players in the world and one of the greatest players in the history of bagpiping. Won gold medals, tons of gold medals to prove it. Why wouldn't I want to mimic him, follow him? I want to, I want to have the mechanics of my playing be as good as his mechanics. The tone of my instrument as good as his tone. The execution of the tunes as good as his execution. That's what we're doing when we follow Jesus. I want my life to mimic His love, His devotion to the Father, His prayer life, and on and on we go. So it shows who you become. You become imitators of your mentor. 
I, the greatest compliment I could ever have would be if someone says to me, hearing me perform or play, you sound just like that guy in Canada. And I'd go, really? That's incredible. The greatest compliment you could receive is for somebody to say, man, you remind me of Jesus. When I, think, when I think of the love of God, I, 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 the way you've been loving me, that, that, that's what I think about. What would be the greatest compliment as a church that we could receive across the community? And if you, you want a place where people work out their faith and they love each other when it hurts, when it's down and dirty, and, and they hang in there with hope they never give up, you need to go to that First Baptist Church. That's the kind of church I want to be known for. I don't care if people like our building or think it's beautiful or not beautiful. If that's all they have to talk about us, then the thing they should be talking about hasn't yet risen to the surface. I want the conversation in the community to be that group of people loves each other. They have faith in Jesus. Men, no matter what hits them, they're hanging in there in Jesus. That's the good stuff. You become imitators of, of the Lord Jesus Himself. And, and that creates an observable change. Christians should demonstrate observable change. If you're still like the person you used to be before you said, I got saved. If the same behaviors, the same values, the same drive, you take lessons from the same person, <laughs> Satan, then your claims about Jesus are just talk. Just like preacher talk. Hey, praise the Lord, it's all about God. When it's not, there's an observable change because you are imitating your master. That's a term we don't like either. Your master is Jesus. Jesus, as your Savior, has the right to say, live this way. Follow this. This is what I want of you. That's what Jesus says. One man has written these words about this word imitation in this verse. He said it was an imitation in the deep and basic sense of the word. It was a bringing to expression in their own lives of what they had seen and detected outside of themselves. Until you start seeing that Jesus has something outside of you that you need, you won't follow as a disciple. It's going to be yakety yakety yak talk. It was a capturing of something they had witnessed around them and making it a part of themselves. I think the most powerful church that could exist would be the church that exhibits God in all kinds of circumstances so that the word on the street is, it's real to them. They don't talk it. They walk it. They embrace the truth. They don't just say, come to Sunday school. Here's your quarterly. Come to church. Here's your sermon. And they stuff it up your nose and say, be religious. I don't care if you ever get religious. I do care if you become a follower of Jesus Christ. There's a big difference. Well, their conversion exploded from the inside out and they became people unlike the city they dwelt in. The city of Thessalonica was an up sort of city, not a down. It was prosperous. It was progressive. It had all the ingredients of a place you would love to live in. 200,000 people. Business was great. Religion was very pagan. And these Christians came out of that at the risk of family, of jobs, of everything. And they, they embraced Jesus because they embraced their teacher, Paul. And Paul pointed them to the Lord. This is an incredible, an incredible explosion. Well, then he goes on to say, You received the Word of God in much affliction. So, they received the truth. Notice how they received the truth. Having received the word in much affliction. It's a word that means heavy, intense pressure. You can imagine if your boss heard you became a Christian and said, Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, you're a Christian? Can't teach in this school. You're a Christian? Can't work in this factory. You're a Christian? Can't have those kind of people. Out of here. That was the risk they ran in this day. They were under intense pressure, intense persecution, that if they 
embrace Jesus, they might lose everything else in their world. We, we don't live into that kind of pressure at all. But Paul is saying, you became a receiver of truth. Now, a lot of times we look at pressure and we say, well, as a Christian, I don't want to be under pressure. And there are many people who claim to be Christians and once they get under pressure, they immediately resort to, oh, where's God? Oh, I thought Jesus wouldn't send me through this. Where did you read that in the Bible? Well, I thought as a Christian, I'd, I wouldn't have to deal with, you know, stress and pressure and life would get better and I, and I did it all be better all around. Where did you read that in the Bible? Well, I don't know, but I, I just thought when I got saved that Jesus would put this bubble around me and, and it'd just be Christmas every day. I'd say, Jesus, I need a new car. He'd go, all right, here's a car for you. Jesus, I need a new house. And Jesus would go, all right, here you go. Or Jesus, I got a cold. Zap it. He'd go, all right, all zapped. These Christians received God's Word in times of deep pressure. We're often accused as Christians of being people who use faith as a means of escape. We don't use our faith as a means of escaping from the pressure. Our faith enables us to go through the pressure, through the intensity. And our walk through the intensity of suffering is a display to the world of the validity of our faith, the genuineness of our faith, that our claim is not just talk, it's walk. And that's the difference. If we as a church come together and we sing, What's an assurance? Jesus is mine. Hallelujah. Holy, holy, holy. Or whatever songs we pick to sing on a given day. And then as soon as we get rattled, we go, oh, I'm, just, I'm losing my faith. I'm losing my faith. I'm losing my faith. What in the world are you doing losing your faith? Well, I'm going through some pressure. We'll get through it. We didn't get through it. That's not kind. Well, yeah, that's kind. Because the Holy Spirit enables us to go through the pressure, not around the pressure. Somehow we've got this view that Christians go around the pressure. No, we go through the pressure like everyone else does. Our flesh, our body lives in the same world as non-believers. We go through the same deterioration of our bodies as everybody else. But we have something different. We have the power of God within us. So the outward suffering does not offset the inward joy that's given to us by the Holy Spirit. He says, you've received the Word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. So the way this church suffered was their testimony. It's not a matter of if you'll suffer, or if you're going to go through stress, or if you're going to have downturns in your finances. It's not if you're going to have trouble in your relationships. It's not if... It's when. And since you know it's when and not if, then the question for the believer is how? Then how do we go through this? That's our testimony. I have never seen in all the churches I've pastored as much death and cancer and sickness and suffering as I've seen in my two plus years in this church, in this community. Never seen it. But what I've also seen is an amazing testimony of men and women who have walked through the trials, walked through the pressure, and said, Jesus knows, Jesus understands, and Jesus will take me through it. And the most reoccurring comment I've ever heard is this comment. I don't know how people would get through this without the Lord. I don't know how people would manage this without Jesus. You know why they can say that? Because their experience with Jesus is real. They've received the Word in pressure. They maintain their walk in pressure. As they go through pressure, the testimony only gets bigger. There's some amazing testimonies in this church of men and women who suffered deep loss, agonizing difficulties, and yet their faith remained strong, they persevered in their hope, and they continue forward. So hang in, believers. Well, verse 7 tells us, though, that when you receive the Word, it spreads your influence. Look at this. So that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. We received from Jesus through Paul, Paul kept preaching the gospel. Do you know why you're here 2,000 years basically after this was written? 
Because somebody shared the gospel to somebody who shared the gospel to somebody who shared the gospel to somebody who shared the gospel. And eventually you heard and you received. And here we are a church in La Follette, like this church in Thessalonica. And we're still doing what they were doing, which is receiving the truth and showing who we are by what we do with it. Paul is saying, you changed. You changed. If you're not changing, you're not growing. I didn't say, if you're perfect, you're not growing. Uh-uh. Well, that's not going to happen. But if you're growing, you're showing something. And you're spreading an influence. He uses a, an interesting word here. You became examples. The word originally had the idea of like, like taking a, a copper, a piece of copper, and stamping the imprint of a coin on it. So that the blow that was struck to that piece of copper, let's say, left an imprint, an undeniable imprint, that says, oh, that's Abraham Lincoln. Look at that. Copper penny. Abraham Lincoln. When someone sees the scars in your life, they see the pressure you're going through. They see from that pressure the imprint on your life. What do they say? Oh, that's a tragedy. Oh, that's horrible. Oh, that's terrible. Or do they say, whoa, so that's what Jesus looks like. It's not that we avoid suffering. We use it. We go through it. Now, I'm not, I'm not inviting more. Don't get me wrong. I don't want any more than I've got. Do you? Not at all. I want to be the kind of church that is producing by setting the right standard and living in such a way as it proves what we've heard is actually from the Lord Jesus. So I think back to my teacher. And there have been times when my teacher has gotten so aggravated with me because he'll keep trying to tell me how to fix something over and over and over and finally I get it. But sometimes it takes a lot of instruction for me to get it. And I have to practice and practice. And then I get it. And then I go, what? what? I, I did I not see that before. Jesus is constantly trying to take you as a Christian to another level. If you think you know all there is to know because you've been listening to sermons for 50 years, it's like throwing a speck of sand in an ocean and thinking you've, you've blocked the water. There's so much. I wish I had five lifetimes to study. No, I wish I had 66 lifetimes because the first lifetime I'd study the character of God in Genesis and the next lifetime the, Je the character of God in Exodus and right on through the Scripture. I want to know God. If there's not enough time to know all, I want to know. But I'm taking it in everywhere I can get. Everywhere Jesus is trying to speak to me, I just pull that hose up and say, let it flow. If I could read a hundred books a day on every book of the Bible so that I could understand deeper the character of God, I'd do it. If I could grasp the lessons Jesus is trying to teach me every day through my pressure and my stress, oh man, think of where I would be so much further. And I want to be part of a church that says the priority is Jesus. We know, we know the right standard, faith, hope, love. And we know that it matters what we do with this Word. If I'm not taking it in, it's staying out. If it's not coming in, I'm not growing. Some of you got vitamins in your cabinet. If you don't take them, they don't do anything for you. Right? church. If you don't take it, it's not going to do you any good. And a lot of you come to church and you get a vitamin and you go, great, when I put that in the jar with the rest of them. Well, swallow it. Take it in. So you grow and get better. That's what the Word of God is here to do in our lives. Pray with me.